Welcome back, everybody. Joe Marion here from ASCDI. Um, our next session uh, is going to have to do to do with data erasure. Um, in order for us to reuse many of our products we sell in a socially responsible manner, you need to make sure that the, you're not compromising anybody's data. Uh, a recent study that I read showed that 36% of enterprises reported relying on what is inappropriate data removal methods. Uh, they'd be using data wiping methods such as uh, formatting, overwriting, using free software they find on the internet. Um, um, in the old days, um, well, actually there are two ways you can get rid of data. You can destroy the object or you, or you can erase the object. In the old days, we would destroy the objects. And what we would do is we'd drill holes in them right? Or we'd shoot them with bullets here in the United States, because that's, we have all the guns here. We shoot them with bullets, right? Or we'd slam them with uh, hammers. Uh, we use bleach. We put bleach on the drives. Um, that's how we would kind of erase data in the old days. Um, what we do now is a lot more environmentally friendly because we're able to put the products back into productive use. So what we've done today is we've invited three of the best in data erasure to kind of talk about this subject. Uh, we have U-Wipe. Um, Ariel, you made it back. Good. Uh, Ariel's back. We have uh, U Wipe. We have uh, Frederick from Blanco. And we have uh, our newest ASCDI member, John Woodward from UltraTest. Uh, guys, welcome. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Thank you so much, Joe. Thank you. Welcome. Um, look, real quickly, uh, before we, uh, we go into some questions, uh, tell us a little bit about your individual companies. Uh, Frederick, start with Blanco if you could. So, uh, 20 plus years and we've been around ever since uh, we had those erasure processes that you described, Joe, uh, the drill bit and uh, bleach and uh, all of the above. Uh, but today uh, we're present across the globe, work with over a thousand iPad partners closely and are happily seeing that data erasure is becoming a mature art uh, for data security. Great, thank you, uh, Ariel. Tell us, tell us about um, uh, UI, please. Or he's frozen. John, can you hear me? Okay, let me let me jump. Yeah, yeah. In. Let, so, let me switch over to you, John. Uh, tell me, yeah, tell me about Ultratest. No problem. So yeah, as you said, we're we're a fairly new member, but uh, yeah, Ultratest as a business now is three and a half years old. Um, as you can see by our logo, we've been around, in fact, 25 years, part of the ultra tech group. Um, we take a slightly different approach than uh, my two colleagues here in that our product, our solutions, a combination of both hardware and software married together um, to really regenerate and repair product. Um, and the erasure element of it is very much a, a, a you know a, an integral part of what we do to recertify the product um, for reuse. So we, we take a slightly different approach, but we're kind of all in the uh, uh, the same uh, the same bag, I guess. Got it, got it. And Ariel, are you? Can you hear us? Okay, I think Ariel's having connection problems. Okay, well let, let's keep going for a minute then, guys. As I mentioned um, on the introductory. Uh, comments um there's a lot of free I, I, I can hear you well oh can you there hear you me? go ariel yeah we hear you now good tell us tell us a little bit about your company please no he's gone again all right we're, i'm going to move it on so uh as i said um you know there are a lot of free erasure uh stuff out there uh software um there's uh, that you can find on the internet is that an issue? Uh, let me, I guess, uh, let me start with uh, Frederick. Frederick, should users be cautious about some of these low-cost data erasure solutions? Yes, indeed. And I mean, this is a professional event. Uh, we're all professionals that are doing this as part of our um, uh, profession. Uh, when you talk about data erasure today, there's a number of key aspects. You need to make sure that you have perfect security you cannot fail on the security part and that goes with compliance verifications that you can live up to different standards and certifications but besides security it's all about efficiency uh, the industry today is chasing minutes seconds if you are processing hundreds of thousands of devices and you're able to save one, two minutes per device, 
It's all about the money in that efficiency. So if you can scale and create an efficient process that is 100% secure, that's where you have the big value. If you lean on something that you download on the internet, you might have issues with both security and you will for sure never be able to reach the kind of automation and process uh, throughput that is so crucial to be competitive in this industry. So I think that's my short answer. Okay. John, any experience on, on some of these low cost? Sources? Yeah, I think I think just to just to add on from what Frederick was saying, also the ability to to trace products and tra trace assets as part of the um, erasure process or the regeneration or repair process. And and again, if you're using standalone cheap software, you 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 might have a paper trail, but you're certainly not going to have an asset database or something you can potentially go back um, back in time to. To, to prove and uh, qualify that, uh, that the erasure took place on a certain device at a certain time and also to a certain standard, obviously. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned during an earlier session, uh, ACI has been looking at uh, or been involved with a blockchain project to see about, you know, maybe putting some of this information you know, in a secure manner on the blockchain so you can, you know, kind of trace data erasure on, on these products, uh, uh, just so you know. Um, next question question I had was, uh, oh yeah, geogra geographies. Um, us Americans think that uh, Europe is all one big country, you know, but I kind of, I've traveled around. I know that's not the case. And I know that uh, compliance for data re erasure, not only within Europe, but within various countries differs. Um, who, uh, let me see, let me, who, who do I throw that one out? Let me, let me start with you, John. What, what do you, what do you know about that? Um, so yeah, from, from our, our perspective, um, you know, we our solution allows the customer to choose exactly what level of um, data erasure standards they want to use, and and, and they they can then apply that based on um, local uh, local legislation. Um, within the product, in terms of certification, we've taken a slightly different. Uh, perspective and actually gone for an independent certification body where I know UIP and Blanco have gone a different route um, and uh, have gone for certifications um, in a, in a, on a local basis. Um, but, you know, I think there's a lot of red tape around the certifications, I think, in, in terms of, and, and the great thing, certainly in the US with the NIST standard, it's a common standard across a large territory. In Europe, it gets a lot more uh, convoluted and, and confusing. Um, some customers will work to some standards, even if they're not, let's say, local standards. And it depends on who the end customer is as well. Um, so, we, you know, we, we, we have customers in, in certain territories that are say, yeah, we want to use the NIST standard. Others want to use CESG, you know, the UK standard. So it, it is, a, it is a, a bit of a minefield. Okay. Uh, uh, Frederick, to you, uh, what do you know about the different standards within Europe? You know, it, it's highly relevant. Uh, you will find local flavors. Uh, for example, in France, you have uh, uh, the ANSI, which is the local government institute for uh, securing and certifying and approving products that can be used uh, by government. But also larger enterprises within, uh, within France will look at the ANSI, for example. So they would request a product that is approved by the ANSI. In Germany, you will find BSI, for example. So I think one of the core thing, if, if you want to work all over Europe, you need to be prepared to, to meet those both local requirements that you might come across, uh, as well as living up to more global guidelines. John mentioned uh, the NIST standards, making sure that you have the correct verification and implementation of the NIST standard and also that you have uh, uh, someone that can verify that you have done a correct implementation. Mm -hmm. uh, we find that common criteria is important in Europe and also uh, growing in importance elsewhere in the world. Uh, so there's a number of things here to look out for and you definitely have to respect the European differences. Mm -hmm. the, um, I, I understand that, oh, tell me this is a question really, Frederick. Um, is is the difference in requirements have to do with the numbers of times you know a disk might be wiped like like is it five times in in one country and three times in another country is that is that all it is or is it, is it more than that well uh, the different standards and requirements that come from uh, uh, different national bodies could have slight differences uh, 
mm-hmm. in requirements. Uh, they're all they're all streamlining and becoming more and more the same. But I think more uh, uh, you have to be more observant. What is the customer asking for? Yeah. Because the end customer, the large enterprise or the government customer, they will have a policy in place. And in that policy, they will often spell out uh, Department of Defense, NIST 800-88. And for example, if we hear DOD, we know that that policy haven't been updated in, in quite some time mm-hmm. because NIST has completely overtaken and DOD themselves refer to NIST. But those policies don't change overnight. So if you come into a project and you want to be able to make uh, a proposal and live up to the shell requirements, you might have to meet what is specified in that policy. So when you choose to go to market, you need to have good coverage for all of these different flavors uh, to make sure that you are fully competitive in all different tenders and proposals. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Um, So, uh, John, uh, well, Ariel, can you hear us at all? Yeah, I, I can hear oh, you. Can we? Okay, good, good. Keep, keep talking for a minute. Let me see if, we got, if you got a better connection now. Um, tell us okay. about UWIPE before, before we go on a little bit. Okay, so uh, UWIPE is a, is a young company, young company uh, in, the, uh, in the arena. We have uh, been uh, just, uh, just almost uh, four years uh, in business. We are located uh, in Finland, uh, but we are operate uh, globally. So I mean, uh, we're very proud uh, to be um, to be um, the, the you know the young kids uh, around the, in the block. <laughs> so uh, I would like to add a few few words to what uh, Frederick just said about the geographic uh, compliance. Please uh, do. And uh, in Europe, if you still hear me well. Uh, yes. So uh, I would like to say that it's very much like like Frederick says, it's very much organization uh, dependent. Uh, for instance, if you're talking about NATO, about militaries, this is really cross. You no, know, this is global. This is global. So you may have NATO militaries uh, across Europe, but the, the standard would be pretty much the same across uh, NATO as organization. Um, so they're, they're definitely we're talking about DOD, about NIST uh, standard. Uh, but uh, within uh, geography, within Europe, I would say sector and segments is also very, very important. Uh, for instance, uh, if you look at Luxembourg, a very little, very little um, uh, democracy in in Europe, very little country, but still very meaningful when it comes to financial uh, to financial uh, aspect, because you have basically every branch of every bank in the whole world is located in in Luxembourg. And because of that, they have very strict regulations, which are just Luxembourg related and relevant. Uh, For instance, no data can leave Luxembourg in under any circumstances. And therefore, they have very strict um, uh, law or requirement, which is called SPSF, uh, which is um, completely just Luxembourg relevant. Uh, But the same will apply within Europe. Um, You know, the most equivalent to that when it comes to banking and financial world will be uh, Switzerland. So Switzerland and Luxembourg have got a lot in common um, because of the financial uh, background. Uh, so so uh, that's the only thing I still wanted to add. Um, okay, thank you. Thank everyone. you. <laughs> no, th- thank you too. You know, you know, it almost sounds for for simplicity purposes that you'd want to you know data wipe everything to the highest standard and not worry about the lower standards. Or is that? Uh, but I, but again, that might be time consuming. Uh, any thoughts on that? Yeah, no, absolutely. And um, uh, we're all striving for efficiency in production at the same time as meeting the requirements that the end customer is putting forward. So you always have to work with those two things in mind because you don't want to waste time in doing something that is over the top. If you really understand data ratio down to a T, you can create perfect security with the right kind of implementation and verification and one, one round of overwriting if you're talking about magnetic media. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you're uh, talking directly to the drive and you can verify that all different uh, parts of the drive have been unlocked, etc. Mm-hmm. But if you're doing uh, SSD drives, for example, I was going to ask you about that. That's I'm good. I'm good. yeah, no, no. I mean that that's the uh, hot topic, right? How to do the SSD drives? And uh, today you you're processing millions of SSDs, and you can do it extremely efficiently by by using crypto arrays or hardware commands combined with verification and making sure that it has worked correctly. And that can save you once again, several minutes per drive. 
And then when we talk about 100,000 drives a passing time. through, that's about 20 work weeks for, yeah. for an operator. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, extremely important to think about both those aspects. That's, hey, Ariel, SSDs, uh, any, any experience on that? Yeah. SSDs is, is different. Um, it is definitely very very different than uh, what we you know what we normally uh, dealt with uh, in the past. Uh, you know with the hard drive um, erasure. Uh, so SSDs, um, you know, we have to comply with um, uh, with this uh, standard. I think uh, it's it's important to note that uh, we you know Blanco, UWipe, um, you know other data erasure companies in this business. We are the developers. You know, um, our word is is as good as. As it, as it is, but um, the uh, the final word comes from those who certify us. You know whether it is the NATO who approves us or assured, assures us, or whether it's the common criteria, which level of common criteria, which is uh, you know whether it's a government uh, organization. So there, you know, it, it's their final word. They are the ones who are uh, testing us, uh, certifying us, um, and and they are the ones uh, who are basically uh, warrant um, our our product. So I think that's also very very important to mention. Um, so once you are certified for something, are you certified, you know, is it for hard drive, magnetic erasure, is it a solid state drive uh, or, or anything else in, in between? So, uh, John, yeah. SSDs, any, anything before we move on? No, absolutely. And I think, uh, you know, what Frederick and, and, and Ariel were touching on in terms of the, the technology now that's built into product, uh, and this is SSD, but also also with hard drives, you know, as the capacities of drives build and build and build, so using some of these older techniques, and there's certainly, I think, a responsibility on our side in terms of educating both the ITAD sector, but certainly then uh, in turn educating the users out there um, in terms of what are the, uh, the the methods that need to be used some of these old methods and i know you frederick mentioned dod earlier was designed around uh you know methods used for drives that were developed 20 25 even 30 years ago um you know and where, where it was multiple passes single passes uh, and single overwrites of hard drives now is is absolutely adequate for modern modern product um the nice thing moving forward now is, is as we get into these higher capacity drives, you know, 14, 16 terabytes and new products will be coming down the line, 20, 25, 30, 30 terabyte drives. Using standard um, overwriting methods are going to take, you know, hours and hours and hours, if not even potentially days. So there is technology being built into these products now, which allow you to um, issue specific commands to erase the drive within the device itself. Um, Crypto arrays yeah. is certainly one of those, um, whereby you have um, encrypted, you know, uh, encrypted data with a, an encryption key, and you effectively de delete the, the 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 keys themselves, which renders the data inoperable. Yeah. Um, the only problem I've, I've seen with that with the NIST um, certification is that they do also recommend that you do an overwrite afterwards which is seems a little strange but um yeah i think the technology themselves the the, the vendors have realized that the products have to keep up with uh, you know with practical and uh, uh practical processes john you kind of anticipated my next question which i just I moved up onto the screen um uh, ariel how about you uh so the question would you touched on john is how many times you know does a drive need to be wiped you know and uh, uh ariel what's your thoughts on that yeah, that, that, that's one of the questions that, uh, you know, <laughs> most of the new players come into the business, they, they, they basically come to you, they turn it to us uh, with this question. So, I mean, uh, one of the answers is that, you know, the majority, it may sound strange, but the majority of our customers, whether they are ITADs, whether they are uh, federal government, uh, you know, or corporates, they are using the one-time overriding and uh, mainly the um, the HMG infosec um, you know web baseline. It is it is those more specific, let's say, uh, data centers. You know, data centers that it will not allow any disk to leave the premises unless they are properly erased within. They have the certification, the erasure report, the the uh, which is verified. So uh, these are the more cautious ones that will uh, make be an exception and will you know demand the the DoD or or the NIST uh, standard. So I mean, these are, these are the exceptions, but the majority are still, you know, using the HMG InfoSec uh, low. And I must all add to that that uh, you know it's it may sound not reliable, but it it definitely is with current technology, um, as as John also has stated. So um, if you look, if you're erasing old technology of let's say uh, 20 years ago, please use uh, Peter Goodman's. You know this is uh, 35 time erasure. This applies to that technology of those days. But we're talking about nowadays, you know, one, two, three years 
all drives. So where the technology of, or the at least the the, the guidelines to erase those and this kind of technology is, you know, the latest guidelines and, and erasure standards should, should be applied. And it's also worth mentioning that um, not only we erase those according to those guidelines, but we also uh, perform the, uh, the verification. And the verification can, can vary anywhere from, you know, 10%, 25%, or even 100%, which means that we will, with a 100% case, we will read every sector that, or every, every bit that we have been overriding, we're going to read it as well. So, of course, it will take longer, but, you know, if, the, if it's a question of security that you're going to compromise, then you, you're going to carry it out. So even one-time erasure with proper proper firmware erasure included and, and proper uh, verification at the end can be very, you know, very high quality. Mm -hmm. uh, Frederick, any comments on, multi on multiple data erasures? No, I, th I think we've said the most important uh, uh, facts already, but uh, I see a clear trend in the market that we are moving to uh, NIST purge and uh, sometimes approved NIST clear operations. So I think NIST 800-88 is turning into a global reference uh, point and is uh, also in Europe becoming the, uh, uh, the leading go-to document for creating the security uh, that you're after. And if you read the NIST um, guidelines properly, uh, you know that they are only guidelines. So they are defining the kind of security level that you need to achieve. And with today's technology, you can design your erasure process uh, to perfectly meet the criteria within the NIST uh, and do it as efficiently as possible. You can design workflows that take into account exactly what kind of drive you're processing, uh, what kind of uh, rules you should have for that drive to process. And once again, it's all about operational efficiency and saving those minutes mm -hmm. and never compromising on, on the security. But definitely NIST 800-88 is, is, is big in Europe as well. I'll tell you what, you know, what impresses me about you three gentlemen is that your focus on the customer. I mean, I've heard the word so many times, you know, it's what the, you know, you got you to listen to what the customer wants and you got to have to deliver it and come through. You've said that many times, many different ways, and uh, that impresses the heck out of me. So thank you guys for that. Um, uh, how long, how long should it take for a drive to be wiped? Um, and is there a way to speed it up? Uh, who, who wants it? John, let me start with you. Okay. No. Um how long's a piece of string, I think, is the answer to that one. <laughs> so, um, again, it depends very much. The, the obvious one is the capacity of the drive. The, the, the higher the capacity, the more overwriting you have to do to securely erase a drive. Um, there are other, some other factors that then play a part. Also, the age of the drive. So, we hear about RPM, spin speeds, transfer rates. Um, those obviously have an impact as well. So, uh, if you took a, I don't know, a a one terabyte drive that was 10 years old and a one dr terabyte drive that's maybe, you know, a current product, the current product is going to be quicker. Mm -hmm. Then, I, as I mentioned earlier, there's also a number of factors now coming into consideration with the technology that's built into the drives themselves. Um, and certainly uh, our technology will always look for the fastest way to erase a drive safely. If it can use, um, you know, the sanit you know, sanitized commands, if it can use crypto erase, then it will do so, which is a lot quicker. Um, but um, ultimately, it's yeah, it's it's down to the uh, the size of the drive is probably the the the, you know, the biggest single factor. Mm -hmm. That's with hard drives. SSD are, are much much faster just by the nature of the product, and hence the reason there's a, a move to SSD technology in laptops and 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 uh, desktops, etc. Uh, Ariel, any way to speed that up? Yeah. You know, any, uh, how can, how can you make this stuff faster? <laughs> To speed it up, that's um, speed it up. You know, you can you can maximize. Um, you know, once your technology is is properly in place, then uh, you know you can be as fast as the technology allows you, allows you to be. Uh, but uh, at least you can you can try to be more efficient. We see um, highly efficient customers. You know, during the day work, uh, they uh, they like um, uh, run uh, multiple sessions uh, with uh, let's say eraser stations with twenty discs per station, uh, which will last between two and three hours per session. 
uh, of average disk of between 500 and, and one terabyte uh, of one-time overwriting. But you know they will they will leave all the all the more you know the, the bigger size disks for the for the evening. You know just before uh, you know we're going going back home, they're just going to fill up all the erasure stations with the largest disks or the disks which are the slowest, which will work overnight. They come in the, in the next morning and everything's done. So I think uh, being creative, being you know be, being smart. Uh, can can bring you a long way, at least in this um, highly time-consuming business. <laughs> so, yep, yep, yep. That's fair enough. Uh, one, I'm going to move on to one more question as we um, oh, oh, went too fast. Um, uh, Frederick, uh, how should users uh, verify erasures, and how long do you recommend they keep those reports? Well, the the order trail is absolutely crucial, and how you manage that order trail. It should be an efficient process where everything is automated so that you have uh, the order trail uh, stored in a database where you can easily manage it and export it and present it to the end customer exactly how they want to see it. Uh, crucial there is to have API inter uh, integration so that you can make sure that systems can talk to each other. And how long should you keep it? Once again, the customer will tell you. They will often have requirements. Uh, when they tender, when they go to you with uh, uh, with their needs, they will tell you uh, it should be five years, it should be 10 years. If they don't tell you, you need to keep them uh, for as long as you uh, uh, continue to do business with that customer, uh, even beyond that point. Uh, so when you build an infrastructure around your reporting and the order trail, it's extremely important that you can scale things over time and be extremely long term in how you handle uh, these crucial documents. Mm -hmm. okay. um, we have about three minutes to go in this session. Let me, I'm going to throw one at you guys. Um, uh, and this is not really a competitive question, but uh, your, your solutions are different. Uh, John, yours um, may be more unique, not, not better or worse, just different than the others. Um, what makes your, your, your solution unique? Okay, so we, as I said earlier, we take a slightly different uh, approach to things. Our background comes from repair and regeneration. Uh, and, you know, and if I go back over the last 25 years of being in business, we would have taken product in and, and reworked that product, make it fit for reuse. Um, what we decided many years ago with a lot of legislation and movement of products that, you know, Steve Graham mentioned earlier, that we would be restricted by moving product around the globe. And also from a um, you know, an ecological point of view, it's not maybe the, the sensible way to operate. So what we decided to do was to take our technology and then enable to deploy it where the customer wants. So really the number one focus for the customer is to take a product of an unknown quantity with data on, with not data on, who knows, put it through a process that will regenerate that product fit for reuse. Um, and then also in, in, to ensure 100% that it's uh, it's secure and erased correctly. Um, so as I said, we take a slightly different approach. Um, whereas you know Frederick and uh, Ariel look at certainly more at the end user point of, of being able to uh, erase in in the data center. That's not traditionally our place at this moment in time. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so you say regenerate. You mean what I would in layman's terms repair, right? Fi fix yeah, it. by software. So we use a, it's, it's a, some you know, some some advanced software techniques to be able to take a drive to map out errors to recertify um, and put it back up to a grade A status Got fit it. for reuse. I right, just we have to like one more minute. So real quick, uh, Frederick. Uh, we all know Blanco, but what you know what makes Blanco different? Again, not better, just different. No, I, th I think the key trend at the moment where we see uh, most of the ITAD customers investing is uh, automation, that you want to make sure that you get the throughput maximized. And when I say automation, it means that you can tailor your process. You can do hundreds of drives at the same time, but you can handle those drives individually different depending on criteria. And all of that without any manual interaction. Mm -hmm. So this kind of automation, we call it intelligent business routing, IBR. Uh, we see great advantages compared to how we just uh, performed ITAD operations only a couple of years ago. Yeah. So there's a tremendous shift happening in the industry at the moment. And I think that automation uh, is also crucial 
when our ITAD partners uh, get asked to come on site and do on site erasure, that you can bring these uh, solutions also into the customer's network mm -hmm. and perform the sanitization on prem because we see those requirements uh, increase as well a lot. Okay, great. And I was going to ask Ariel the same question, and he just blipped off. So, uh, um, guys, thank you. Uh, our, our next session is going to start in just a minute now. Um, but I want to thank you guys. You, you've been remarkable. I've learned a lot. Um, we're going to sh uh, sh we'll share some information about your companies with all the attendees. And uh, is anything literature, anything else you want to get to them? Let me know. We'll make sure to uh, disseminate it to everybody. Excellent. Thank, thank you so much, much, Joe. Guys, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for being part of uh, ASCDI Europe. We appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Uh, guys, our uh, attendees, our next session is going to start uh, with IT Resellers Green New Deal. We're going to talk about that for about 30 minutes, and then we're going to have our social networking hour. So bear with us. We'll be back on the stage in just one minute. Thank you.